Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 324 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing, man? Good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. Okay, so this is the final podcast of 2021. It's the podcast where we go over the fights of the year, the the prospects of the year, the knockouts of the year, all the rest of the, the, the things there. We've had, of course, you, the listeners, send in so many contributions. We're really, really pleased with those. Before we get into any of it, though, we're going to start with the review part of the show. Um, just one fight, really, to review. We're going to start here with this one. Um, it took place in Russia, I believe it was. Um, where's it gone now? Um, yes, took place in Russia at the USC Soviet Wings. Over here, former world title challenger Maxim Vlasov, now 46 and 4. It was his 50th fight there. A win on points over 10 rounds unanimously against Felix Valera. That one was for the Eurasian Boxing Parliament light heavyweight title. Um, Valera down in round two, down in round four, and had a point deducted as well in round nine. God. Uh, scores all over the place. Uh, 100 to 86 on one card. God. Uh, but yeah, win there for Vlasov, like I say. That's it, though, for the reviewing. We're now going to talk about the the categories of the year, fighter of the year, young fighter of the year, under 25, female fighter of the year, fight of the year, knockout of the year, British fighter of the year, prospect of the year, upset of the year, and trainer of the year. I think that's all the categories there. Um, so, yeah, we're going to start with one of those i'm going to let eddie pick it out then of course after this we're going to welcome our special guest on this week's podcast former unified middleweight world champion daniel gill so you pick out the first category eddie uh let's go prospect of the year prospect of the year i've got my papers here and yes it's here okay so prospect of the year um Xander Zayas, this one was sent in by Rob Triple One Three Eight Zero Three Five. He says Xander Zayas, obviously the Puerto Rican prospect. Isaiah Hurtado also says Xander Zayas. He also gives an honourable mention to Young Mark Castro. Uh, Jay Cowan sends in Jared Anderson, the heavyweight, the real big baby, and um, Tuba TJ as well sends in Jared Anderson, Connor Ben for, I think it's Jay Steele, 88, Montana Love from Schoolboy Let, uh, Jerron Ennis, that one was quite popular here, uh, came in from Johnny Jangles, 11, and a guy I think called Mercurial1005, he says Ennis from the US or Dalton Smith from the UK. Um, there's a bit of a mix up here already because some people kind of not sure if a prospect is a prospect or if a prospect is a contender. So I'm going to unfairly, after I've asked for the for the prospects, I'm going to merge it with contender of the year. Um, so it does include the likes of Virgil Ortiz, the likes of Jerron Ennis and a few other guys. You, you can't have a belt, though, for this category. Uh, what's your thoughts on some of those guys that uh, have been mentioned there? I like, I like obviously, if we're going to, you know, put in... Jerron Ennis and, and kind of running guys like that who I feel like are more contender than, than prospect. But if you merge them, I like those. Uh, I even like Jared Anderson as a prospect, obviously. Uh, what's the other one again? I'm sorry, Xander. Um, Zayas, yeah, the Puerto uh, Rican. About 19. Yeah, yeah, I like Yeah, yeah and I, I mean, I like those picks. I mean, those are all talented guys who have bright futures. Um, but if I'm going to pick, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably say either I'm going with, I'm gonna go with um uh with, with I gotta I gotta go with 
uh, I can't even get his name out, right? <laughs> what is wrong with me? Yes. Uh, if, if I'm going to go, I couldn't get his name. I don't understand why, but it was, <laughs> I couldn't get his name out. But I was, I would either go there. Or, um, yeah, I would go there pretty much. If that's what we are, you know. Yeah, prospect slash contender. I'm going to go with Virgil Ortiz just simply because he still kept his 100% knockout uh, streak going. Obviously, two knockout wins this year, one against former world champion Maurice Hooker in what was a great fight, by the way, and also the other one against the mean machine, Igis Kavalowskis. Um, Ennis has got two knockout wins. Again, one against former world champion Sergei Lipinets and one against Thomas Delorme in which he got caught just before he knocked him out. Um yeah, I kind of picked contenders myself, but like I say, there's that kind of, you know, there's no official, uh, when do you become a contender? It's a, it's a it's a difficult one. There's no real step between. I guess maybe it can be when you've beaten a guy that is in the top 10, or you're in the top 10, or you've beaten a guy who was a former world champion, just like Virgil Ortiz against Hooker, just like Ennis against Lippinets, just like Conor Ben against Chris Algieri the other week. Um yeah, anyways, that is it, though, for the prospects. Let's move on now to upset of the year. Uh, this one was was um, was was a was a good one, actually. There was a lot of upsets, I think, this year, but this one was probably one of the biggest ones. Um, Kid Galahad losing his world title to Kiko Martinez. That one, very popular, sent in by Cruel Jono, Matty Wright, Rob, triple one, three eighty, three five. Um, Joshua five zero double two double seven oh five. Some of these numbers, um, yeah, that's a that's a huge huge upset there. Especially the fact that Kiko, I don't think, had won a world title fight for seven, eight, nine years maybe, and Galahad looking so dominant. And it was at a weight really that Kiko Martinez, I don't think, was you know suited to at all. Um, Cambosos versus Lopez has been mentioned as well from Isaiah Hurtado, Tuba TJ, Johnny Jangles 11, Bearded Hammer, Ferna Tom 89, J Cowan TV. Uh, they all go in with Cambosos, Lopez. Also, J Cowan gives an honorable mention to uh, Rosado knocking out Beck the Bully. This is a good one. And Mikey Garcia losing to Sandor Martin. Only one person nominated that. That was from Punchlines Boxing. All brilliant upsets. Um, I'm going to talk about my upsets as well. Obviously, I've got my own list combined. And um, hopefully, there's some people that have very similar picks to me. And hopefully, we can give away a couple of T-shirts. I'm going to you know, get onto that at the very last part of the show, the outro. I'm going to go back through the list at the end and see if anyone deserves a T-shirt. Um, so, yeah, my upsets of the year. Vargas. Um, knocking out Josh Warrington, that was a huge upset. We saw the rematch, although it ended in a no contest after about one or two rounds. Um, Valdez knocking out Bashel, huge upset. Um, we had Sergei Boachuk losing to, I think it was Brandon Adams. He got knocked out by Adams. That was a massive upset considering Boachuk, I think, was 18-0 and with 18 KOs. Kid Galahad to Kiko Martinez, Sander Martin beating Mikey Garcia, uh, Lopez beating, oh sorry, losing to Cambosos. But for me, one of the biggest upsets of all was the Indian superstar, boxer, um, I think he'd been to the Olympics maybe maybe two or three times, um, as I say, bo Bollywood actor, uh, policeman, Vijender Singh. Uh, Vijender Singh losing by knockout to a guy who had a really dodgy record. It was like five and one with a draw. A guy called, I think his name was Art Sef, Art, or Artish Lopsam, I think his name was. A lot of people have forgotten that one from March of this year. Um, that, I haven't seen mentioned by anyone. That's a huge upset there. Huge upset. If anyone would have said that, 100% a t-shirt would be on the way before we even finish this recording, Eddie. Um, that's the upsets of the year. Let's go on to the next category, uh, Trainer of the Year. A few selections as well been sent in here. Sugar Hill Steward. This one came in from Bearded Hammer. I'm just thinking Sugar Hill Steward. Obviously in the corner with Tyson Fury, in the corner with uh, Nico Ali Walsh, the grandson of Muhammad Ali. Um, we've got Lomachenko's dad. That one's coming from Isaiah Hurtado. Okay, so he would have been in the corner for Lomachenko's fights against... Uh, Nakatani, in which he looked unbelievable, and Richard Comey, in which uh, he was also quite sensational, and of course in the corner with with Usyk when he when he pulled off the win against Anthony Joshua. That's a really good call there, actually, from um, Isaiah. 
Um, Andy Lee, that one's come in there from Gavin BR74. It feels like he did some good work with Joseph Parker. I just don't think he's had enough time or enough fights, enough different fighters as well to be in the shortlist for me. Um, Eddie Reynoso, a very popular one, certainly amongst the, the people that sent him in. That would have been the winner if it was up to the... Uh, you know, up to the listeners, up to the people that sent in their ones. This was the most popular one of the lot. Johnny Jangles, 11 going with Reynoso. Jay Cowan uh, gives an honourable mention to Ben Davison but goes with Eddie Reynoso. Uh, Rob, 111-38035. Punchlines, Boxing, Schoolboy Let, all go in with Eddie Reynoso. But for me, Jay Cowan gave him an honourable mention. I'm going with Ben Davison, British... Um, trainer of course former trainer of Tyson Fury I'm going with him obviously it's not so much to do I can't take much away or much good away from the uh, the Billy Joe Saunders Canelo fight although I think it was a really good fight while it lasted due to uh, Ben Davidson's tactics um, so I give him a tiny little um, tiny little round of applause for that one um, but yeah really what did it for me was that you know he he led Josh Taylor to the undisputed title at 140, beating Jose Ramirez back in May. That was huge. Um, Lee McGregor as well, demolishing Karim Guerfi for the European title in just a round. And then most importantly of all, guiding Lee Wood, who I think what had lost to Jazza Dickens like a year earlier for, for a, British a British title, goes on and um, fights for a world title, knocks out the Chinaman Kan Zhu, he was, he was a huge upset. It should have been mentioned, really, on the upsets. Um, and no one's ever seen Lee Wood box like that before. Um, that, for me, solidified uh, Ben Davison's status as a coach. You know, he's done some work as well. Some people forget, done a lot of work with Devin Haney as well. Um, not sure what his role is entirely in that camp, but he's certainly part of the corner and stuff. So he, by far, for me, um, over the likes of... Um, Eddie Reynoso, who had a bit of a dodgy one when he um, was in the corner for Andy Ruiz against Chris Ariola. Yeah, that's my picks. Um, okay, going on to the next category now. We're going to go to this one here. It's going to be quite a quick one. British Fighter of the Year. The the uh, the method behind this, though, is that you can't be a world champion. So it can't be um, Tyson Fury. It can't be Josh Taylor. It's got to be a guy who doesn't hold a title. Preferably not even a champion at all, to be honest with you. Um we only had two people send them in, or three people send them in. Jay Cowan says Lawrence Ocoli. Straight away, he's got a belt, so no, he is not included. Um, the other two people sent in Connor Ben, and they were Johnny Jangles 11 and Rob 111 So they've both gone with Connor Ben, and yeah, that is my British fighter of the year, Connor Ben. Um, I'm not going to get too carried away with the fact that he's beating guys really and truly that are you know, past their best now, obviously, you know, he, he knocked out Chris Algieri, um, obviously a win against Samuel Vargas, knocked him out, and then went the distance with, oh god, can't remember the guy's name now, uh, Adrian Granados, yeah, went the distance with him, um, completely dominated him, and the improvement that we've seen from Conor Ben in the recent years also helps him in this category. So for me, certainly British Fighter of the Year. In second place, I've actually got a top four. Um, in second place, I'm giving it to Zach Parker. Perhaps didn't have the best names on his record, but to get three knockouts, one against Vaughn Alexander, knocked him out in, what was it, a round, I think? Um, got rid of him in a round. He'd never been stopped. He'd been in there with a few decent fighters. And then he's just gone in his last fight and beaten um, Luis Arias, who was coming off that win over Jarrett Hurst. So, you know, that was a brilliant win there for, for Zach Parker. He knocked out Marcus Morrison, and we know that Chris Eubank Jr. had gone the distance with him in the fight before. Um, and he'd knocked out um, Sherzod Kuzinov as well, who was a really good amateur. I think he's about 44 years of age, so certainly long in the tooth. But um, he'd never been stopped either. So he stopped three guys that had never been stopped this year. So for me, I mean, he's WBO um, super middleweight number one mandatory for Canelo. This guy is the real deal. I've said it for years. And in third and fourth spot, they're tied, but they deserve a mention. Um, Maxi Hughes, simply because he just seems unbeatable and unstoppable at the moment. The run he's on is incredible. I'm so over the moon for him. You can't begrudge him any opportunity. They're even talking about him fighting Devin Haney. You know, this is a guy that I think 
was working on a building site up until recently. I think he actually still works on a building site. It's unbelievable the run he's on and and the wins that he's picked up this year of both. I think he's had two fights. They've both been excellent. As for Jason Cunningham, beating Gamal Yafai, becoming European champion, going and beating Brad Foster, who was a solid prospect. He as well, from being a complete opponent that you know, comes in there to fight people like Reese Bellotti. I think he was winning against Reese Bellotti, then he got knocked out. He is just weirdly improving. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. So I've got to take my hat off there to Jason Cunningham. What a really cool guy he is. Jason Cunningham and Maxi Hughes got a lot of respect for those two, and so should everyone else. Um, so they're third and fourth for me. I'd love them to be first and second. But, um, yeah, joint third, I'm going to say. That's the respectful way to do it. Um, that's it for British Fighter. Moving on now to... Uh, let's go with Fighter of the Year. Um, we've had Cruel Jono sending Usyk. Just him going with Usyk. And then everyone else unanimously, including myself, has gone for this man here. Canelo Alvarez. Yeah, so um, that one from Johnny Jangles 11 jcowan.tv, Isaiah Hurtado, Rob11138035, Jerry McAllister, James V, all going with Canelo, including myself. 3-0 this year, three KOs, a knockout against Gilderim. No one knows how he got into the mandatory position. Uh, he's, he's not really that good. Um, beating Billy Joe Saunders, smashing his face into two pieces almost. And then the win against Caleb Plant, another really good win. He took the O as well of Billy Joe and Caleb Plant. So he's beaten two undefeated world champions, took both their belts. Um, yeah, definitely fighter of the year, to be completely honest. I understand that Cruel Jono went with Usyk, but he's only had the one fight all year. I think that... Um, that uh, George Cambosos deserves a deserves a shout, but he's only had one fight all year, um, so they unfortunately don't get in it. And for me, it is Canelo once again. I think he won it last time as well. Unbelievable fight already, and an unbelievable year again. And we're already getting on to next year. He's already got the fight penned in at cruiserweight. Damn, yeah, yeah. He's, he's got a hell of a year planned for us next year too. But um, I don't really think there's any other there's any argument really with who should be fighter of the year in that. You know, had uh, I think the best year uh, of anybody at this point, with the exception of you think of um, like Combosis, like we, like we mentioned, Usyk had a good a good year with those with those fights, but they were single fights. He had a, a three fight run, all knockouts, all big wins. So I think I think it's safe to say Canelo. Yes. And moving on now to the young fighter of the year, you've got to be twenty five and under, so that includes world champions. So. Um... Some people sent in uh, a few few different names here, a few different names sent in. So Dennis McCann from Big Della Gaming. Now, he's a great prospect, but he's not the best fighter under 25 years of age this year. I don't think he had the best 2021 of all guys 25 and under. Raymond Ford sent in from one Danny Hamo, I think it is. Um, again, a couple really good wins, including a knockout win over Reese B Bellotti, but... Um, yeah, not not for me the best fighter, 25 and under. Jared Anderson, that one's coming from, I think it was Smelody's OG. Um, what else do we have? Um, Jaron Ennis from Daryl Cobb, uh, The Pope 84, Joe Abaddon 13, Luke Byrne, T. Cole 20, Pat Marugi, jcowan.tv, um, all going with Jaron Ennis. Okay, um... Devin Haney sent him from Asaya Hurtado. Again, the thing with that is I think I wasn't overly impressed with Devin Haney against Linares. And obviously the, the win over Diaz was, was quite a good win, to be honest with you. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess he does deserve a shout, but he's not going to win it um, in my eyes. He's not going to win it in my eyes. Um... Sonny Edwards has been sent in by Rob11138035. Um, and Shakur Stevenson who is my, my pick, was sent in by Schoolboy Let, Johnny Jangles 11, uh, sent him in as well. The reason behind that simply is because he's had two fights the, this year. He's beaten um, Jeremiah Nakafila. It wasn't a great fight, let's be honest. The less said, the better on that. Um, but he, he, you know, he dominated him one every round. The guy wasn't really that great, the Namibian policeman. I had him on the show, I think, the week before the fight. Um, beat him easy. 
Uh, didn't really get out of first gear. It was quite frustrating. But then the way he beat Jamel Herrin was so impressive. And not to mention that there is a few guys on this list that hold world titles. Sonny Edwards, um, you know, uh, Devin Haney, Jaron Ennis, not yet. Jared Anderson, not yet. Raymond Ford, not yet. Dennis McCann, not yet. Um, but he is a two-weight world champion now. So that's got to be considered as well. So for me, Shakur Stevenson, number one. Um, my number two is Sonny Edwards, just because he dethroned Maruti and Fanlane, or however you say the guy's name. He'd been a champion about 10, 11 years unbeaten. And um, Sonny Edwards completely dominated him and looked unbelievable. And then he defended his title as well against Jason Mama. Um, a little bit of a rocky start, but obviously went on to completely dominate and get in his groove. And as I say before, when Sonny Edwards gets, Sonny Edwards gets in his groove, you can't take him out of it. And he's almost unbeatable. Uh, did you want to weigh in on that, Eddie? Uh, yeah, I was going to agree with you. You know what I mean? I, it, to to see the way that Shakur uh, handled um, himself, in, even in the fight that most people don't want to talk about, just understanding what his role was and how to win and on a bad night is another thing. Uh, and for somebody so young to be able to do it and understand it, and then to come and look sensational against um, uh, Jamel. Boxer's brain, Jamel, yeah, <laughs> Boxer's brain. Anyway, to look sensational like he did against Jamel, I mean, I feel like he's he's the one guy that that, that should be mentioned at that position under 25. So uh, I think it's a good pick, Joe. Thank you. And moving on to the female fighter of the year. A few different females sent in here. Johnny Jangles 11 says Sinisa Estrada. It's a good pick. I think she's had three fights this year. Uh, I think one knockout. She's quite a powerful puncher, especially considering she's a woman at minimum weight. She's obviously world champion now. Um, you know, she's got quite a fan base as well. A lot of people like her style. Um, but yeah, for me, not fighter of the year, but close. Very close. Uh, Katie Taylor been sent in by J Cowan TV. Um, Tuba TJ uh, as well. I'm not seeing that one, to be honest with you. I'm not seeing Katie Taylor. Um, Amanda Serrano, this one sent in from Jake Paul Haters Anonymous, which is a bit weird because obviously Serrano's on all of Jake Paul's undercards. So Jake Paul's favorite female fighter is Amanda Serrano. This guy here is Jake Paul's uh, Haters Anonymous. If it's even a guy, it could be a female, could be a fridge these days you can identify as anything you want so whatever it is it has tweeted saying serrano i think she's had a good year um but not for me not not <laughs> not female fighter of the year 2021 um savannah marshall been nominated by richard harvey again uh she had a fight cancelled i think in in was it november or december she had a fight fall through but still, I mean, the fight didn't happen. I don't know if she would have fought and looked good. It would have still won a fighter of the year for me. Um, um, Baumgardner as well been sent in by Schoolboy Let. She got that crushing knockout against Terry Harper. She upset the odds. And um, she showed us that the power is real. It was a devastating KO. Um, but yeah, I mean, that one win I don't think was enough to, to, to clutch it. Um that's it for our nominations from the listeners, from the Twitter uh, people that interacted with us. But my female fighter of the year is Chantel Cameron. I think she absolutely blitzed uh, Melissa Hernandez, who hadn't been stopped for years and years, had so much more experience as a pro, being a world champion, uh, you know, being undefeated for, for quite a while, um, you know. And the way she dealt with her, she completely annihilated Melissa Hernandez, Um you know, in the States, like I say, on her soil, and she, I've said it for years, she's such a problem for anyone, if I was managing any female fighter that was anywhere near Chantel Cameron's weight class, I'd say, look, we're going to have to move up in weight to stay away from her, I wouldn't want them going into a sparring session with her, she's a total animal, um, and I've said it for, for many, many years, you know, bring on the Katie Taylors, bring on all these other ladies, bring on the Natasha Jonases, I'm sure that um, Chantel would move up and down the weights to make some of these big fights happen, the reason the big fights are not happening is not anything to do with her, um, I should mention, obviously, our other win, uh, the bigger win of the two, was against Mary McGee. And again, I really like Mary McGee. I've kept in close contact with Mary McGee since the loss. I was sat ringside. I watched it. She completely dominated Mary McGee, who, um, despite being in her mid-30s, had kind of found like a 
a second wind in her career. She seemed like she was at her absolute best. She was carrying power in fights, carrying power late in fights, and Chantel Cameron just did not allow her to get a foothold the entire fight. And any time they traded off, she got the better of it. You know, she's been in control in every single fight she's had, Chantel Cameron. She's been in control for every second of every fight she's had. And I think that she's got the potential to be in control for any fight she has in the in the next few years. I think she's that good. I've believed in her from day one. Um, and yeah, for me, fighter of the year. And she's already got her next fight lined up with Callie Reese. I think she knocks her out. Uh, we're going to see. I mean, she's about to, in my opinion, become undisputed at her weight. She is unbelievable. My second uh, female fighter of 2021 is actually another female that wasn't nominated. It's Jessica McCaskill, simply because she had an amazing fight last year with C- Cecilia Brackow. Some people said it was a hometown cooking decision. It was a great fight either way. They did the rematch earlier this year. Everyone seems like they've forgotten it. I think it was very early in the year. Can't remember what month now. But she showed the world, really, that the Brackhouse win wasn't a fluke. There wasn't, you know, any hometown judge decisions, no no corruption. And she dominated her even better in that rematch, you know. And Brackhouse is still a huge name in women's boxing. She was still undefeated for all that time. Um, and she's got the better of her twice now, uh, Jessica McCaskill. So that could be the biggest win in women's boxing all year, to be honest with you. I can't think of another one. I don't think Chantel Cameron against Mary McGee was a bigger win. I think that's probably the most impressive win all year. You know, Clarissa Shields hasn't had a big fight all year. Savannah Marshall hasn't had a big fight all year. Uh, Who are the other names on here? Um, Serrano's had, I think, maybe one big fight. Katie Taylor hasn't had a big fight all year. I mean, let's be real. Let's not talk about the Natasha Jonas fight as as a big fight. I'm not sure many people were tipping Jonas. I thought she'd knock Jonas out. Um, Baumgardner with a good win, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give her some some major credit for that one. Anyways, that's it. That's my top two. Chantel Cameron and Jessica McCaskill. Moving on now to... What have we done there? Fighter, young fighter, female fighter. We're now on to the final two categories. Um, fight of the year. So this one was sent in by Ring Gang Radio and Isaiah Hurtado. They've sent in Lopez Cambosos. Again, I think that Cambosos dominated the fight. I'm not sure it was back and forth enough for me, me personally, to uh, to judge it as the best fight. I mean, there's no wrong or right answer, but just in my opinion, it's not what I want for fight of the year, but it was a great fight. I'm not taking that away from you guys that sent it in. Usyk vs. AJ says, Jake Paul haters anonymous. It is back. Uh, with this nomination here. Um, Again, a great fight, but not enough back and forward, not enough momentum swings for me. Um, Chocolatito versus Estrada 2. Brilliant, brilliant shout there from Tuba TJ and Johnny Jangles too. I think Tuba TJ also said that um, the most excited he's been for a fight all year was Wilder Fury 3, but this one was his fight of the year considering how tactical it was. He's right with that. Um, Fulton Figueroa says schoolboy let. Um, But yeah, I talked about um, momentum swings and back and forth, and you can't get much better than Fury Wilder 3. That is my fight of 2021. The knockdowns from both guys, um, you know, I I, I bet on the fight to not go the distance, and I can't believe uh, they, they even went as far as it did. Uh, I think, what was it, round 11? But yeah, that one was sent in by jcowan.tv, by 65, by James V, by Ultras Podcast, by Punchlines Boxing, by Rob1113835, by Matt Ritchie as well. That one, the most popular one, and the rightful fight of the of the year for 2021 for me, Eddie. Yeah, agreed. Agreed it had every uh, everything you would want in it. You know, it had enough drama, had a uh great level of, of excitement obviously throughout um you know with both fighters getting put down and just when you thought that one was about to you know pound the the nails into the the final nails into the coffin and one guy would you know basically come off the come out of the grave and knock him down and and once again be you know gain the upper hand so it was it was a very very interesting uh, fight that went back and forth however i still felt and that Tyson had, con- in, you know, when you know when he was on when he wasn't on the ground, had pretty much control of the fight. So I feel like it was only a matter of time before he gained complete control. Especially looking at how um, 
Wilder started to end up. You know, he started to get a little tired, a little, a little weak as the fight wore on. But still got to give him credit. He stayed in it. He made it interesting all the way to the final moments. Yeah, certainly. And I think Wilder, by the way, has got a crazy chin. Uh, they, they showed some clips this week of his fight with Luis Ortiz when he almost got knocked out because obviously Ortiz fighting this weekend. I still watch those replays wondering how on earth he stayed on his feet. He's got such a chin. Uh, moving on to the KO of the year. Um, this one here was sent in by Na Suleimana. Uh, he said... Um, Wilder's, well, Fury's knockout over Wilder. It was painful for me to see being a fan of the Bronze Bomber. Uh, Rosado versus Bektamir Milakuziev for Rob 1113830 uh, This one here, knockout of the year for Johnny Jangles 11. Um, Isaiah Hurtado, Punchlines Boxing, and Jay Cow. And they all go with Valdez versus Bashel. And that is also my knockout of the year um it's just the fact that no one gave valdez much of a chance before the fight obviously newly kind of moving up in weight to take on a killer like bershell who was avoided really by all the other champions all the other fighters in the weight and it was an upset win and the knockout itself when valdez ducks under bershell's right and left hooks to pull off the left hook counter and it happened at 259 so two minutes 59 when when you know the bell's actually going for the end of the round while bershell was on his way down face first to the canvas it was a brutal brutal knockout some other knockouts that i'm going to mention that some people um haven't mentioned um obviously rosado milakuziev someone did send that one in uh, rob um, Buaxi against that guy, uh, I think his name was something, Daniel Dos Santos or something, that was a big knockout, a Jagba, Effie Jagba against, um, against Howard, um, Michelle Rivera against John Fernandez was a big knockout, and Mark Magseo against Julio Seja, that was a huge knockout as well, if anyone remembers them, they were all good knockouts there. That is it, though. We've gone through the categories as quick as we could have done. We've done fighter, young fighter, female, uh, fight, British fighter, trainer, upset, and prospect of 2021. The final thing for us to do before we wrap up part one is to welcome our special guest on what is the 2021 end of year special podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former IBF and WBA middleweight world champion. It is, of course, Mr. Daniel Gill. Daniel, welcome to the show, my man. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, it's absolutely my pleasure. So, Daniel, first things first, I like to start these kinds of interviews all the same way, really. Um, what's your earliest memory of first ever putting on gloves as a youngster? My first ever memory? Yeah, wow. Well, gone back a while now. Uh, so... I remember, I remember I was, would have been yeah nine years old, and I, I'd asked my dad about yeah doing some boxing, and uh, he, he took me down to a, a local boxing gym, and uh, I remember you yeah, know walking through a really old school boxing gym, um, seeing guys punch the bag, uh, yeah it was like an old pretty dirty sort of gym as well. And uh, and I think at that moment I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. And yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure I had yeah laced the gloves up and had a bit of a punch on the punching bag. And uh, yeah, pretty much yeah went from there. You boxed as an amateur, obviously, uh, before turning pro. You were at the Olympics in 2000. What was your highlight moment, Daniel, of your amateur career? What moment kind of stands out to you most as your personal favorite moment? Uh, yeah, that's, that's always a really tough one. I, I get people asking me that one a, a little bit. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's hard to yeah, hard to choose between, yeah, you know, obviously representing Australia but, uh, at the Olympics in 2000. I mean, it was, it was a huge thing for myself being being pretty young at that stage. I was only 19 going into that. It was, like, one of my first big tournaments as an amateur. Um, so, so that was, like... A massive, uh, yeah, I guess opening to you know, the international stage um, as an amateur. Um, yeah, so I always find it hard because that that was definitely pretty special, especially because we stayed, uh, we we travelled for like uh, I think about two and a half months, yeah, prior to the Olympics around the world on training camp, and we didn't arrive um, yeah, back to Australia. Yeah, it was. It was pretty close to when the Olympics started. We arrived back to Australia and 
yeah, it was it was amazing when we arrived back. You know, having such support and uh, the atmosphere in, in Sydney at that time was yeah was amazing as well. Um, yeah, I guess the other time uh, was yeah the 2002 Commonwealth Games. Um, you know, obviously at, at that stage I'd had a bit more uh, a fair bit more experience and um, yeah, I, I've never been a super confident kind of person. Um, you know, I'm very confident in my boxing, but just never a super confident person. Um, but for that tournament, for the Commonwealth Games, I just felt like I, I just knew that I was going to win a gold at that that tournament. Which for me, I was like I said, I was never cocky. I, I never, yeah, I didn't go around telling everybody that was going to happen. But I just believed in myself, and uh, yeah, to make that happen as well, it was a, a pretty special moment. And getting on to your pro career, obviously you made your, your pro debut October 1st, 2004 in Southport. Uh, you boxed a guy called Danny Bellet. Um, you knocked him out in the third round. Tell me about what you can remember of that Friday night back in 2004, your pro debut. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that being pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty nervous, uh, pretty keen and willing to put on a good performance. My first, uh, my first fight as a professional, um, yeah, it was it was interesting, you know. I turned up the, at the venue, um, got all my stuff ready, went out the back, and and there were a few of the uh, kind of veteran other fighters on the card that night, and uh, you know I had had a fair few of them coming up to me and, and wishing me all the best, and and kind of chatting me, chatting to me like mates as well, which which was interesting because you know I, I see some of these guys on on these Friday night fights cards before. Um, but yeah, I, I found it interesting that they already, they already knew of me as well, which which was pretty cool. So they gave me a little bit of confidence, and uh, yeah, I knew I had to go out there and, and put on a good show. And and Danny Bellet, he was a yeah an experienced fighter as well, and uh, I knew he was going to give me a pretty good fight. I want to jump forward now, uh, you know, qu- quite a bit here. I want to talk about the you know, probably your biggest fight at the time, I'd say by some way, the fight with Daniel Dawson, obviously him being 29 and oh, it being for the IBO world title. Um, tell me about that one. Cause I know that was a big fight in Australia at the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, there'd been a, a bit of hype about it. And, uh, I think previously we, we were set to fight and the fight got, uh, called off as well. I'm not sure. I think maybe he got sick or something. So it was about a week before the fight that was scheduled, um, he pulled out. I think through sickness. So you know that was pretty frustrating. And then uh, yeah, finally got the opportunity again to 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 make it happen. Um, you know it was uh, it was a big fight. I had seen him fight a few times before, and I, I knew of him. I knew he was a power puncher, a strong fighter. Um, from the kickboxing background as well. Uh, so I knew it was going to be very dangerous. But I think at that point in my career, especially, like I, was, I was very, very hungry, very determined. And I knew that was going to be a, a huge stepping stone. Um, yeah, well, it wasn't that long before that I went to uh, one of his bouts in, in, yeah, in person and, and watched him fight. And I think he knocked the guy out of the first round. Um, which is, is yeah, a pretty devastating fight. But I watched that fight and I was very confident and I knew exactly what I needed to do. Um, yeah, and he definitely gave me a tough fight, so it was great. In boxing, um, you know, certainly when you get to the highest level, Daniel, you, you either need to be naturally talented or you need to be a really hard worker in the gym. I want to ask you, uh, you know, looking back, would you say you were more of a natural talent or a hard worker? Uh, it's a good question. I, I think I had a bit of both. Um, I, I know, yeah, I was definitely a hard worker and I, I knew, yeah, from an early age, I had to put the effort in and I had to do those extra things. I, I went for a run more, I trained harder. I, I felt like, yeah, I did the stuff when, when other people um, were resting. I was out there training. So I knew that I had a, a really great work ethic um, I'm not sure about the natural talent. Like I, 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 I felt like I had to work my butt off for it. But I know that, yeah, I guess I developed that talent as well. Um, yeah, probably through all that hard work. 
No, it's a good, it's a good answer there. I, I just, I probably should have saved that uh, question for later on in the interview. Obviously, we <laughs> we see it a lot. Uh, you know, Adrian Broner is a great example. Supremely naturally talented, not so much a hard worker. Whereas there's a lot of really hard workers yep. that don't have that God-given natural talent, and in some cases, they yeah, have better right. careers uh, due to the hard work yeah. than some of these naturally talented yep. guys. I want to jump forward in your career uh, to May twenty seventh, two thousand and nine, a Wednesday in Queens. And at this point, you're 21 and 0. Obviously, uh, you box the former two time super middleweight world champion Anthony Mundine. You go 12 rounds, you lose a split decision to the former champion. Tell me about this fight and yep. I guess how it felt to lose for the first time in a close fight on points. Yeah, yeah, I guess the, the lead up to that was, was uh, yeah, interesting as well. Um, yeah, everybody knows how yeah, Anthony Mundine can. Can sell a fight. He, he's a good. He was always a good talker. Um, so, so I mean, that was fun. That was interesting. Um, but yeah, I guess I went in there the same as I had been previously. And I was very hungry. I, I knew this was a, a huge opportunity for me as well. Uh, fighting him on, on a big stage. Um, yeah, I guess the, the pay per views and stuff as well. So it definitely put me put me uh, out there a lot more. Um, yeah, but the actual fight, you know. It, 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 Thought it was a, it was a yeah, good fight, great fight to watch. Um, you know, I I enjoyed myself while I was in the ring, um, as well, which was fun. Um, yeah, I, I knew at the end of the fight it was extremely close, and uh, you know, I was extremely disappointed that that I didn't get the decision. I felt like I'd, I'd you know taken the fight to him throughout, but you know that that's uh, that's part of the sport that the fighters can't control. So yeah, it it wasn't it wasn't the kind of thing as well. When I lost that decision, it wasn't the kind of thing that I felt like oh, this is the end of the world or anything. I, I still felt like uh, it was a it was a little bit of a hurdle, but uh, a bit of a blip, uh, yeah, along the road. But yeah, I felt still as hungry as ever, and I knew that wasn't going to slow me down or, or would definitely stop me at all. Oh, yeah, all I needed to do was just get back to the gym, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, back myself, but also believed in my team as well, and uh, yeah, yeah, I knew there were some big fights ahead of me again. See, it's an interesting one because I speak to a lot of guys who lose a fight before becoming a world champion, like what happened here with you. However, sometimes the loss can make you or break you, but most times people lose badly. They get knocked out or they get completely outclassed. Where you lost in such a narrow fashion, you arguably won the fight. Did it did it kind of put you in a case where it made you know, make was it a make or break moment or not so much because it was such a quote unquote loss, it could have gone either way? Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't feel like it was a real yeah, loss. Like I, yeah, it didn't feel like a real loss. Like I didn't feel, I didn't felt like I didn't get beaten in that fight. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, like if anything, like I felt like I came out of the fight the stronger person, um, and, and I also felt like I I learnt different bits and pieces from that as well. So you know, I, I took the positives out of it. I kind of. Yeah, left left all the negatives to the side and just yeah helped helped it to improve me and made me even hungrier to be honest. Excellent, man. And five months after that, you returned to the ring with a points win over Samir Dos Santos Barboza. Uh, two fights after that, we're now in October 2010. You box in an eliminator for the IBF middleweight title against former IBF light middleweight world champion Roman Karmazin. Uh, this one takes place in Homebush. Tell me about that one, Daniel. You knocked out a former world champion in the 12th and final round. I saw the fight once again the other day. He was completely gone in that 12th round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I, I felt like I had a, a plan and a strategy for that fight. You know, my team worked um, with me. You know, I feel like at that point, I probably had one of my best training camps, trained extremely hard, had great sparring throughout. Um, but, yeah, I guess my plan was a, against such a, a, a skillful and, and experienced fighter was just, just to break him down um, round by round. And, uh, you know, I felt like I went out there and uh, I didn't, didn't go crazy, didn't, take too many too many silly risks just just kind of chipped away and, and just worked hard kept the pressure on um I, I felt like my distance was great in that fight and yeah it just kind of broke him down round by round and uh i, I knew when the time was right um yeah in the last round to, to take advantage of that 
That was a brilliant win. I like the way you came on so strong late on. Um, the next fight after that certainly was a big one, of course. Saturday, May 7th, 2011. Not sure that um, I have to remind you of the date. I'm sure it's permanently etched in your memory. You travel to Germany. You beat the then IBF middleweight world champion, Sebastian Silvestre. The fight ends in a bizarre split decision after 12 rounds. Um, Tell me what you remember about that night, the fight itself, and of course, what it meant to you to become a middleweight world champion. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, with that fight in particular, like I, I knew traveling on um, yeah foreign soil, like um, yeah, New Brandenburg, where, where the fight was held, it was a relatively small city in, in Germany, and uh, yeah, he, he had plenty of support, um, but I also knew that. You know, with with the crowd, I just need to keep the crowd as quiet as possible. Um, the, the German fans were, were very supportive, so um, the better I did, the the more quiet the the crowd stayed, and I knew that helped my uh, case when it came to scoring as well. So um, yeah, it, it, and I kind of expected it to go to a decision as well, but I knew that my work rate was going to be a, a big factor in that fight. Um, yeah, I knew he would want to. Yeah, go yeah go with him too much i think he wanted to get back and use his jab as much as possible but um yeah it, i knew the pressure factor was going to be a, a big part of that fight and uh yeah i just had to go out there and uh yeah deliver yeah and also that uh, at that particular time as well in germany it was very hard to get a uh, to get a points win over there at the time so you did well to get that uh, i mean Certainly on two of the of the scorecards. Anyway, I'm not sure what the other judge yes. was was watching. Of course, um, when you turn pro, Daniel, because I spoke to you know many world champions. Some guys tell me I already knew I was going to be a world champion before I made my pro debut. When you turned pro, yep. did you always believe you'd become a world champion? Uh, yeah, I, I did. Yeah, it was something I know people asked me. Um, yeah, I guess we just came from the amateurs, and I didn't have a lot of stoppages in the amateurs. You know, I was more of a technical fighter. I was, I was more of a boxer. Had a lot of, of wins on points, um, but but you're not not KO stoppages in that. So so I guess people question my ability to have power and be able to take power um, punching into the professionals. So they kind of yeah they questioned that, but I, I felt like. You know, I, I felt like I had the ability, and, and uh, when I did turn professional as well, I, I knew by getting the right people around me. And unfortunately, I was lucky enough to, to yeah, have Jeff Fanny helping me when I first turned professional. Um, you know, in a great gym, you know, learning off some some extremely you know, good fighters, um, and, and developed that craft, which you know helped me in the long term. And I want to talk about your first title defense. It came three months after your your trip to Germany. Uh, obviously, takes place back in Australia against the Nigerian bad boy uh, Aroma Cell Albert. Um, August thirty first, a Wednesday. You won the fight unanimously over twelve. Do you remember much about that win? Obviously, we remember Albert was uh, like many many other Africans, tough as old as old boots, really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I- I guess I have a, a lot of memories about that fight. To be honest, because I know we went into that fight, unfortunately, with yeah, with a pretty bugged right hand, and uh, yeah, not a lot of not a lot of people knew about that. But uh, I, was, I was dealing with yeah, an injury to, to yeah, one of my knuckles on my right hand, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I fell through. Yeah, had cortisone injections, and I had um, I was seeing physio couple times a week and I was you know, doing everything everything possible to make myself right for the fight and uh, yeah and I thought I had kind of brought it back as well as I could but you know unfortunately in that fight my yeah, my right hand was, was horrible I think the first right hand I threw and, and hit him like properly yeah, it, it caused a lot of pain so you know, I knew I had to fight differently in that fight, and I felt like I, yeah, controlled things. You know, obviously he's a pressure style fighter, and he's going to come to me and, and make the fight. But I knew I just had to box in that fight. I would have loved to have been able to approach that fight differently, but unfortunately, 
yeah, my, my hand wasn't 100%, so I had to yeah, find another way to make it work for me. Yeah, and then seven months after that, you, you successfully defend your world title for the second time, back at the same venue, uh, another points win, unanimously over 12, another very tough African, this time Adama Osumanu, uh, March the 7th, 2012. Tell me about that one, Daniel, another tough guy. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a good fight, another tough fight. And, uh, yeah, I guess uh, yeah, preparing for that fight, uh, even at the press conference, uh, Adama's trainer, yeah, I guess put a lot of, uh, yeah, ha- had some pretty big goes at me about being a, a dancer more so than a fighter, um, yeah, and, and kind of questioned my ability to to to, to want to stand there and go. Um, I, and I guess I, I took that, and uh, you know I knew what I had to go and do out there, and I took it to Adama um, straight away, and, and kind of found it funny in the end because. Um, yeah, but by the end of the fight, I think Adam was, was kind of running away from me trying to survive. So, you know, I, I felt like I, I, yeah, did what I had to do in that fight. I would have, would have loved to, and would have loved to, and, uh, yeah, to make a bit more of a fight of it. But, yeah, I, I just felt like I, yeah, was able to dominate him and, and control it and, and be a lot more aggressive than I think they expected me to be in that fight. Yeah, he stole your dancing shoes towards the end. Adama. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Now we get to um, September 1st, 2012. You travel back to Germany, um, almost like a home away from home, to unify your title with the then reigning WBA middleweight world champion Felix Sturm. You were the underdog, of course. It was, it was, you know, again, very hard for an away fighter to go out there and get a decision in Germany. You pulled it off again, uh, a split decision yep. victory, which meant you were then the unified world middleweight champion. So yeah, tell me about this fight because this is a epic, epic win, and of course, what it felt like to then have two pieces of the pie in terms of world titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess to begin with, a, a lot of people did question yeah you know, my reasons for traveling back to Germany again uh, because I had yeah I had my yeah you know, IBF world title, and and they questioned why I was going back to to risk losing that again because so many others had traveled to Germany previously and, and weren't able to um to beat Felix Sturm but yeah also seen it as a massive opportunity I knew Sturm had been yeah had to, gone the distance with a lot of fighters and uh he, he's a very technical skilled boxer um yeah so it, it was uh it was an interesting fight for me it was something that I felt like it was a, it was a massive challenge my my team as well you know backed me 100% um you know we we spoke about it a lot and uh yeah they they asked me a lot of times do you feel like you're going to be able to go over there and and yeah beat him on, on his home soil and I said yes I I'll, I'll do it um I was yeah extremely confident I was on another one of them ones I guess like the Commonwealth games um, I, I don't know why I felt that way, but I was just like extremely confident. And like I said, like I said to you, like I, I'm not a, a massively confident person all the time, but just in those instances, I was, you know, I was extremely confident. I knew what I was going over there to do. I knew how to do it. I just had to make sure I did it. And I'm going to... I'm going to be honest about this this next thing here. Shortly after the fight, the WBA made the decision to strip you of the title for not facing your mandatory at the time, Gennady Golovkin. However, they also didn't give you the normal amount of time, the normal amount of breathing space after winning a title to fight the mandatory. Yep. I don't want to be. Uh, I don't want to hold back here. I think their decision was BS, to be quite honest with you. Um, how did you feel at the time, Daniel? It, 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 I feel. I, I'm going to be honest here. I feel like if you were a superstar, uh, someone like a Miguel Cotto, someone like a you know a, a super superstar from America, something like that, I don't think you'd have been treated in that manner. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely agree. Uh, I yeah. I feel like they. Yeah, just just wanted to strip me as quick as they could. Like I, I believe, yeah, I'd, I'd almost been stripped of the title before I'd arrived back in Australia um, after the fight. So, yeah, it, it was disappointing. Um, you know, unfortunately, I would I would have loved to have hold on to that title for a lot longer and even been given the chance to fight for it again. But, you know, it wasn't to be. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad on their part, I think. Uh, your next fight, I'd imagine, meant quite a lot to you. You successfully defended your title here for the fourth time, a unanimous decision over 12 rounds in Sydney. January 30th, 2013, you finally got your revenge over the man that took your O controversially, Anthony Mundine, which meant that you could once again say you'd beaten everyone that you'd been in a professional ring with. Um, tell me about that victory, Daniel, and of course the fight itself, and um, he stormed out the ring as soon as they announced that decision <laughs> yeah yeah that was, that was definitely a very satisfying one that that fight um yeah again i went in there very confident um i knew exactly what i had to do just keep keep plenty of pressure on him but yeah, the lead up as always is always yeah fun and interesting with with anthony mondine but um yeah I, I knew i had a job to do but i also knew that you know, I was a, a much different fighter, much more, a much stronger fighter, much more confident fighter um, than I had previously been. So, yeah, I, I knew straight away that yeah, my job was there, and yeah, just just to jump in and, and get it done. But I, I guess it, it was interesting, and uh, some people did make comment <laughs> as well that um, you know he he was upset with the decision in the end. He stormed out of the ring afterwards. You know, a lot of people. You know, including myself, seen it as a pretty comfortable win. Um, but he, he reckons, you know, he, like he said, he got ripped off and, and all of that stuff. But, um, you know, I found that, yeah, very interesting. Um, but, yeah, a lot of people did say that. He, he probably would have said that anyway, even if he got knocked out. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't remember him ever taking a loss too good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, your next fight takes place seven months later, August 17th, 2013, in Atlantic City. You box Britain's very own Darren Barker. Uh, you had him down in round six. I didn't think he'd beat the count, to be honest, but he got back up. He managed to win a very, very tight split decision. A sad night for you, losing the title. I'm pretty sure the happiest night, probably, of his life for winning the title, uh, considering his... Um, emotional backstory. Tell me about the fight from your perspective, and I'm going to be honest, I don't want to upset any of my fellow Brits, but it was close. I don't know if he deserved it. It could have gone either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was a good fight. I mean, it was a great fight to watch. It was a great fight to be involved in. Um, you know, Darren prepared well. Um, you know, I, I knew, you know, I, I had known a lot about Darren before that, and uh, I knew he was coming in to fight. Um, you know, see, I, I didn't really know a lot about his backstory and that. Um, so yeah, I guess there was a lot of emotions. Um, yeah, going into it for him. So yeah, I I just felt like, um, yeah, I felt like it was a tough fight. It was a close fight. I felt like the yeah, obviously the the knockdown was a big tick on my side. Um, but. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, as a fighter, yeah, you're not in control of the scorecard. So, you know, yeah, we, we get it sometimes and we don't get it sometimes. So, um, yeah, the only way we do get to, yeah, control that a little bit more is if there is a stoppage. And, uh, yeah, that, there was a, a pretty close, and as you said, it was pretty close at, at that knockdown stage where I think yeah, the referee called that he, yeah, it hadn't got up in time, but yeah, I'm not sure if he had, so who knows. Um, six months after that fight, you, you pick up a win back in Australia over Garth Wood. Um, just five months after that, though, you're back in the States. You're, you, you're at Madison Square Garden here. July 26th, 2014, you challenge the undefeated and reigning WBA and IBO middleweight world champion Gennady Golovkin. Um you had history yep. with Triple G, obviously. You fought as amateurs, but it's probably not your favourite fight as a pro to look back on, as it was the first time you were stopped. But tell me what it was like yep. to share the ring with someone as good as Triple G, Daniel. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was uh, obviously fighting at Madison, uh, Madison Square Garden. This is a pretty special venue. Some, some yeah, huge history um, in, in boxing has taken place there. So, you know, I remember walking in the... Yeah, the the corridors um, around Madison Square Garden before the fight, seeing you know, the original photos on the wall, like Ali and Sonny Liston, and yeah, you know, just thinking this this place is is amazing. I mean, the the actual venue to to walk inside as well as 
yeah, it's a pretty special place to be. Um, but yeah, I, I felt like I, I prepared well for that fight. I felt like I was in a pretty good headspace. Um, but at the same time, I knew I was in there against a uh, yeah, a, a great fighter as well, um, somebody that had you know immense power. Um, so I knew I knew I had to be on my game there, and I just felt like maybe I made a, a couple of mistakes, and maybe there were a few things that were working against me in that fight as well. Um, unfortunately, but yeah, that that can happen, and uh, yeah, I guess you need to be prepared for that as well. I still have no idea how he ate that right hand that you hit him with, which was a good shot, but still managed to generate enough power to, you know, drop you with his own right hand that was on its way to you before your punch had landed. Uh, you don't see things yep. happen like that too often in boxing. It was quite um, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was a special punch. Uh, the, the worst part about it for me, as well. I, I kind of, in my mind, uh, I had, yeah, for the round before, I had, had thought about, um, yeah, he could, because he had missed me a few times as well, he'd thrown a fair few punches and, and found it difficult to hit me. And I, I knew and there, there would be a stage he would try and punch with me. And uh, so, yeah, I was kind of trying to be very uh, wary of, of that as well. And I guess I just lapsed at that moment where I, I tried to punch and he threw a counter straight after I punched counter straight up straight after. And, uh, yeah, I guess that was the moment that I lapsed that I, and I was more frustrated at myself, for, yeah, letting myself lapse at that moment. Cause I felt like my defense, um, up to that point had been fairly good. I had made him miss a lot and I kind of had seen him get a little bit more frustrated, but yeah, I just, just lapsed when I shouldn't have lapsed, I guess. And five months after the Triple G fight, again, you return to Australia, you pick up a win, uh, this time a, ru a routine points win over former middleweight world title challenger Jared Fletcher. Then six months after that, you're back in the States yet again, this time at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Um, <clears throat> June 6, 2015, you fought for the WBC middleweight world title against the then champion and recent Hall of Fame inductee Miguel Cotto uh, you stopped in round four tell me Daniel once again what it was like to share a ring with a boxing legend really uh, such as Miguel Cotto yeah yeah it was it was pretty special I mean uh, you know yeah I, I knew it was going to be extremely tough the guy had yeah massive amount of experience and I, I'd watched him so many times previously in big fights. Um, so I, I knew what I was up against. So I was kind of frustrated, I guess, a little bit that the fight was that catch weight, um, which which I felt kind of hindered me a little bit as well because the, there was there was some talk, I don't know if many people know this, but there was some talk about me fighting uh, yeah, at a different weight um, before that, uh, before the Kota fight got locked in. Um, yeah, I was going to fight at a heavier weight, and uh, yeah, unfortunately that that fight didn't come about. And then, and then, kind of at the last minute, we found out about the catch weight. So I kind of struggled the whole way through to make weight. Um, I finally made that. Um, yeah, the uh, yeah the, the made the weight. Um, yeah, that they specified, and uh, yeah. You know, I guess it's kind of frustrating, but, you know, I guess in hindsight, you know, probably we should have been a little bit more prepared for, for some of the little tricks that they, they try and do. But, you know, it is what it is. And then, of course, after the Cotto fight, you're out the ring for 16 months before coming back and losing your, your final fight against Reynold Quinlan, KO in round two. Yep. Um, do you know what? Yep. You, can only, you can say something about that if you wish. Uh, otherwise, we can just move on. Yeah, yeah. No, I guess I was. Uh, um, yeah, I guess like I felt like I prepared well again for that fight, but you know, yeah, it is, it is what it is. Just yeah, I guess I had those moments. I had a change of trainer in that as well, and, and yeah, that didn't work for me. So yeah, it is what it is. 
Yeah, of course, credit to Quinlan, but I feel like that's the that's the only bad loss, really, of your career. I mean, obviously, the first one against Mundine could have gone either way. The, the Darren Barker one could have gone either way. To lose to Golovkin and yeah. Miguel Cotter, these are two possible uh, you know, yeah. all-time greats. That one to Quinlan definitely wasn't your old self. Um, I want to yeah. come to you now, Daniel, if we can, for some kind of... Um, quick fire kind of questions i want to ask you you know a few questions about your career just pretty brief ones um for yeah. years people have, have have said is daniel retired the answer has always kind of been no are you officially retired now <laughs> officially i haven't retired no <laughs> i just haven't yeah i haven't, I haven't retired so yeah yeah, it hasn't been officially. Obviously, I'm not active, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not officially retired. Okay, okay. And um, I want to ask you this one as well, and I think you're going to probably have to think about this one. What is your favourite win of all your wins, Daniel? What's the most satisfying win of all your wins? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I I think yeah, the most satisfying yeah would have to be Felix Sturm yeah with what was on the line um, yeah with, with the t- two titles on the line it would have been Felix Sturm in, in front of a big crowd in Germany yep closely followed by Mundine too I guess <laughs> definitely a hundred percent that way <laughs> it was a close call like it was either one. <laughs> And I want to ask you as well, um, who was the best all-round fighter you, you fought as a pro? Who was the most complete opponent you ever came up against? Uh, probably probably would have had to say yeah, Golovkin. Oh. Golovkin, I know, I know, you know, I enjoyed the fight with Felix Sturman. I thought it was a technical battle. It was, it was a battle of the brains and I enjoyed that fight, but yeah, I mean, Golovkin had that as well, but he also had that power too. And that brings us on to the next question quite smoothly. Who hit the hardest out of everyone you fought? Yep, probably probably him. Probably who I mentioned, Golovkin. Yeah. And I want to ask you, Daniel, is there anyone you wish you'd have had the chance to fight, but for whatever reason it didn't happen? I think, I think at one stage there was some talk about fighting Matthew Macklin. Um, but and, and I think that would have been an interesting fight. I don't think that would have been a good fight to watch. Yeah. Um, who else? Uh, she, there, were, there were a couple other ones, but I just, just can't remember now. But yeah, I mean, watching some of the old fighters, you know, obviously you, you'd think about you know how how it would have went. You know, um, yeah, fighting some of like the all time greats and, and things like that. But um, yeah. Yeah, you, you you can't really compare too much. I mean, would love the opportunity to be able to, you know, think about getting the chance in with like you know De La Hoya or even um, yeah, who else? Uh, Roy Jones Jr. Guys, guys like that. Even go going back to the era of the you know, the great middleweights, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, Tommy Hearns, Marvin Hagler, those guys. Um, yeah, they, they ruled the, the middleweights for, for a long time. Yeah, they certainly did. And I want to ask you this as well, Daniel. Do you have any regrets? I, I, I ask this to people. Some people have got a long list. It's quite sad. Some people have got no regrets. I love to hear that. Do you have any regrets? Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think I do. I don't think I have any regrets. You know, I, I feel like I... I went out there and I fought the people that I wanted to fight. Um, I, you know, I felt like I had a, a you know, really good team behind me that backed me 100%. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't feel like I have any regrets. You know, I feel like I, yeah. When people, I feel like when people talk about me, they they kind of hold me hold me with some respect. So you know, I I appreciate that and. Uh, yeah, I don't feel like I like at the moment. Like I said, I haven't retired officially, but I don't feel like I need to fight. I don't feel like I've got unfinished business. Um, you know, if I did decide to jump back in the ring, it would be because I, I want to do that, but it wouldn't be because I feel like I need to and uh, or anything like that. No, no, no. You've got nothing to prove. Um, yeah, no. I think it's it's great. I, I like to hear as well that people 
hold you in higher regard obviously coming from a place like australia not really um known for great boxers and stuff like that i know right now george cambosos is lighting up the scene it's amazing for you guys um i want to ask you as well are you a happy man now uh daniel do you wake up happy every day obviously to a certain degree everyone's a bit annoyed with this pandemic but are you happy every day mm. considering how everything's gone for you yeah, yeah, I'm I'm happy with what I've achieved, and uh, you know, obviously put in a lot of hard work, and you know, I I enjoy at the moment, like I I enjoy helping out, you know, some of the young fighters around, to do little bits and pieces with a little bit of coaching stuff, and and be able to pass on some of the experiences that I've had, and uh, I guess remember back to a lot of the experiences that I've had as well. It's yeah, I guess that's rewarding, and uh, yeah, seeing the enjoyment that you know, young fighters get and, uh, yeah, you know, receiving that experience is, is really good as well. That's excellent to hear, Daniel. Um, I was going to ask you what you're kind of up to day to day, what you're up to work wise. Is that it? You're working with other young fighters? Yeah. Doing little bits and pieces, just, just a little bit of work for myself, just kind of one-on-one stuff. Um, yeah, it's, and spending lots of time with my kids. I've, you know, I felt like, you know, with my boxing um, over the years, like I didn't miss out on a lot with my kids, but I felt like even though I was at home um, a fair bit preparing for some of my fights, you know, I felt like my mind was preoccupied <laughs> a lot with fighting and I, my mind had to be in a different place. So so it's been, been really good over the last few years, really been able to focus on my kids and, um, yeah, spend a bit more time with them as well, which is good. And coming down to my final two questions, Daniel, um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Perhaps should have warned you, but I'm I'm uh, I'm mean like that sometimes. Favorite UK fighter, any era can be from a hundred years ago, can be still fighting now. Um, favorite UK fighter, yeah. any era. <laughs> any era, yeah. Wow, God, yeah, it did put me on the spot a little bit. <laughs> Thinking about. Okay, so yeah, I, I, as as a fighter for for what he did and uh, the skills that he had, I always loved Joe Carsagi. Um, yeah, great, yeah, great technical fighter. Uh, yeah, he he's probably one of the top guys that I, I really enjoyed watching. Um, yeah. I know there's a few more though. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a very yeah, popular. Yeah answer a lot of people like joe obviously you got yeah um, you know prince nasim everyone likes to speak about him yeah. um you know yeah. lennox lewis gets a gets a lot of uh, shouts as well um and just Definitely. my final my final real uh thing i want to say daniel if you've got any closing words just to perhaps your fans in the uk you've got an army of them that that know you and supported you throughout your career i'm sure you've had many nice messages over the years from guys over here real boxing fans but but not just the uk anyone that's listening to this from any part of the world what's your closing message before you leave us yeah, yeah. I just just want to thank everybody that supported me over the years. You know, it's it's you know it, it's definitely an experience being able to you know travel the world and and you know fight some of the best fighters in the world and and to have support from you know, obviously from your home country, but to have support from from you know a lot of people from around the world is is very special. So, so yeah, I just just want to thank all those people that have supported me um, over the years. Well said. Listen, Daniel, it's been an absolute honour speaking about your career with you. I want to thank you for your time. God bless you, and I wish you a happy and healthy New Year, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you, and, and happy New Year to yourself as well. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. I'm uh, going to start here with the the news. Like I say, then the preview in. There's just literally one fight card to go over. Then we're going to get onto your pound for pound list. So let's start with the news. Like I say, only one piece of news to mention, and it took me by surprise. I had no idea it was happening. It's taking place February 22nd. Not sure where it's taking place, but um, we're going to see uh, Vita Belfort, the guy that just beat Evander Holyfield a few weeks ago when Donald Trump was doing commentary. Uh, he gets in with a guy that I had on the show a few weeks ago uh, who told me that he was 75% out of boxing, 25% in boxing. So um, 
that was interesting. But anyway, the 25% of him that was inboxing seems to have uh, got on board for this fight here. So it's going to be Vita Belfort taking on Chad Dawson, former uh, light heavyweight world champion. That's going to be on Triller February 22nd, like I say. All the best to Chad Dawson. It is kind of bizarre. That's it for the news. Moving on now to the preview part of the show. going to whiz through this thing. We're going to get onto your pound-for-pound pound list that you sent in. I think we've got about 14 or 15 of them. Uh, we're going to read them all. Um, so, yeah, on this card here, it takes place at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, USA. It's going to be on USA Fox pay-per-view. Uh, we have on the undercard a good fight between Frank Martin, 14-0, and Romero Duno, 24-2. That's over 10 rounds there. Uh, we've got Gerald Washington, 20-4 with a draw. A friend of the show gets in in a 10-rounder against Ali Aaron Demarizan, who's 14-1, last seen losing his O to Effia Jagbar. We've We've also got the rematch between Jonathan Rice, 14 and 6 with a draw. He beat Michael Polite Coffey, who's 12 and 1, of course. This is the rematch Michael Polite Coffey has to win. A lot of people were even saying he's probably the best uh, prospect in the heavyweight division, some people felt. I think it was Tuba TJ who said that to me once upon a time. And it all come crashing down. He needs to win this rematch. We've also got Frank Sanchez, the Cuban, 19 and 0 in a 10 rounder against last minute addition Christian Hammer, who steps in. I think it was for Carlos Negron. Christian Hammer last seen quitting against uh, Huey Fury back in October. Uh, Christian Hammer 26 and 8, that's over 10. And the main event, Luis Ortiz 32 and 2 in a 12 rounder against Charles Martin 28 and 2 with a draw. I think it's a good fight. I think Charles Martin is a lot better than some people give him credit for. They look at the two round blowout, I think it was against Anthony Joshua. But he's a lot better than I think he showed us that night. Um, and I think it's going to be a good fight. We don't know how old Luis Ortiz is, um, you know, but. We shall see, Eddie. It's two southpaws, two bangers. What do you think, man? Yeah, I think I think it's all in you know how old you know uh, King Kong Ortiz is on the night. You know if he's if he's not, if he's actually still young enough to get them hands off and and, and you know could put fear in the people, then it's a possibility that that he's going to be the man on that you know to be the man that went that raises his hand. But um. And I do agree that that uh, Charles Martin's a little better than people gave him credit for. I think he's proven at different times that he's had some ability and he's a big enough puncher um, to get respect, and more a little bit more than just to get respect. So um, at the end of the day, I think it's all up to Ortiz. He just if he's still if he's still King Kong, then he will definitely win. But um, we just got to see what age he is when we when he steps out in the ring, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And moving on now, we've gone through it as quick as we could. Moving on now to the uh, the pound for pound lists. So um, let's start with this one here. Uh, this first one was was sent in by Tuba TJ. I have it somewhere. Um, here's my 2021 pound for pound list. Number one, Canelo. Number two, Lomachenko. Uh, number three, Inoue. Number four, Usyk. Number five, Josh Taylor. Number six, Terence Crawford. So he's quite high up on the list there. Uh, number number seven, Chocolatito. Number eight, Estrada. Number nine, Triple G. Number ten, it's tied between Cambosos and Nonito Donet. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> Canelo number one. I think everyone's list has to be Canelo number one and Terence Crawford number two or the other way round. They have to. They have to have the number two, uh, the, the top two, Canelo and and um, and Terence Crawford, in my opinion. Inoue being number three, no problem with that. Usyk number four, no problem with that. Josh Taylor maybe a bit high, number five. Crawford number six. I mean, this guy has to be above Josh Taylor. He's already done what Taylor did at one forty, but he also made a mark at one three five, and he's also made a mark at one four seven. Um, Chocolatito and Estrada in there, no problem with that. Really, uh, I don't know. Triple G number nine. Uh, Cambosos, I, I wouldn't have him in my list just based off of one big win. Um, you know, why isn't Tiafimo Lopez in, in that list as well? He beat Lomachenko, who is ranked number two on this list. Uh, Donaire as well, I'm not so sure I'd have him, have him in my top ten. But look, there is no right or wrong answer. That's just me critiquing it. And you can all critique mine when I release it at the end of this list. Uh, Punchlines Boxing comes in here with Canelo number one, Bud number two, that's fine with me. Uh, Inoue number three, Usyk number four, Spence number five. Now, everyone should know I'm not a fan of Spence being in the top ten. Oh, God. Uh, Fury number six. Um, 
Estrada, number seven. Josh Taylor, number eight. Baturbiev, number nine. Jamel Charlo, number ten. I would take Jamel out. I'd take Baturbiev out. I'd take Estrada out. I'd take Spence out. Yeah, it's all right. Moving on to Tom Nichols' list. He's gone with Canelo, number one. Crawford, number two. Fury, number three. That's very high on the list, in my opinion. Uh, we've got Inoue, number four. Usyk, number five. Lomachenko, number six. Taylor, number seven. Spence, number eight. Estrada, number nine. Golovkin, number ten. Okay. Um, I like most of them, apart from Spence. Estrada, I'd probably take out. Maybe, maybe Golovkin. Good list, though. I think that's a good list. I'm not sure I agree with the order, but it's a good list. It's a good 10 names. Damian Adams sends in this next one here. Canelo, number one. Terence Crawford, number two. Inoue, number three. Number four, Errol Spence. Number five, Terence Crawford, number six. Usyk, number seven. Josh Taylor, number eight. Baturbiev, number nine. George Cambosos, number 10. Stephen Fulton. Again, Stephen Fulton, friend of the show, shouldn't be on the list. Um... George Cambosos Jr., friend of the show, shouldn't be on the list. Errol Spence, again, shouldn't be number four. I just don't understand that. I do not understand that. How can he be at number four? What has he done to, to, to warrant being at number four? What's he got, one belt or two belts? Is that it? No. Um, Rob, 11138035, he's entered every single category. We thank him for that. He sends in this list here. Canelo, number one. Crawford, number two. Usyk, number three. Spence, number four. He's there again. Number five, Inoue. Number seven, Josh Taylor. Number s number eight, Donair. Number nine, hang on. Canelo, Crawford, Usyk. So number one, Canelo. Number two, Crawford. Number three, Usyk. Number four, Spence. Number five, Inoue. Number six, Taylor. Number seven, Donair. Number eight, Bivol. Number nine, Cambosos. And number ten, Fulton. So he's got the same nine and ten as Damian Adams. Interesting. I don't agree with either of them, but thank you for the, the contribution. This one now, Chris Lewis. Uh, he sends in Canelo, number one. Crawford, number two. Inoue, number three. Usyk, number four. Spence, number five. He's there again. Tyson Fury, number six. Josh Taylor, number seven. Baturbiev, number eight. Lomachenko, number nine. And George Cambosos Jr., number 10. Again, I just don't understand how you can put how you can put George in and Lomachenko in, but not put Tiafimo Lopez in. Um, hmm. Lomachenko, number nine. It's funny because I don't think I've even seen him in anyone else's list. Oh, no, there, he has been in a few lists. Yeah, one other list or two other lists since we've done them so far. Um, yeah, I think Lomachenko definitely deserves a place in the top 10. Um, that's Chris Lewis. Moving on now to, it's either John Gary Antoine or Gene Gary Antoine, but either way, he's gone with Canelo number one, Usyk number two, okay, number three, Josh Taylor, number four, Jamel Charlo, number five, Errol Spence, number six, Bud Crawford. Obviously, I can't get on board with that. Crawford, number six. We've got Spence above him. We've got Josh Taylor above him. We've got Jamel Charlo above him. I'm not liking that one. Um... Lomachenko, number seven. Tank Davis, number eight. Number nine, Cambosos, number ten, Inoue. Uh, this one is sent in from the Killer B24. He's gone with Canelo, number one. Crawford, number two. Inoue, number three. O Alexander Usyk, number four. Josh Taylor, number five. Artur Baturbiev, number six. Vasily Lomachenko, number seven. Estrada, number eight. Number nine, Kazuto Ioka. Uh, number ten, Nonito Donaire. Um... He obviously likes his um, he likes his lower weights. I think this guy here, but I don't think he's been influenced by any of the other contributions. Like I think maybe some guys have on here. So I respect the list. It's it's not the same list I'd have. Uh, Dan Roach. I like this list a lot actually. Uh, number one Canelo. Number two Crawford. Number three Usyk. Number four Inoue. Number five Lomachenko. Number six Josh Taylor. Number seven Tyson Fury. Number eight Baturbiev. I'm not so sure he'd be in my top ten. Number nine Errol Spence. Obviously, I'm not too pleased with that. Number ten Donny. I'm not so sure about that. But his first seven or eight names. First seven names. I quite like that, and I quite like the order of that. So I'm going to come back to that one. Um, Michael Sprott, former heavyweight um, heavyweight fighter. 
He sent in a list as well. Obviously, we remember he had the fight against Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua is not on his list. He goes number one, Crawford. Sorry, number one, Canelo. Number two, Crawford. Number three, Tank Davis. Number four, Tyson Fury. Number five, Usyk. Number six, Lomachenko. Number seven, Inoue. Number eight, Josh Taylor. Number nine, Errol Spence. Number ten, Artur Baturbiev. Solid list. Solid list. Um, can, yeah, Canelo, Crawford, Davis. What do you think, Eddie? Good list. Yeah, I like that list. I like. I mean, there's a, maybe a name or two that I would have had either shuffled around or maybe removed. But for the most part, I really like that list. That's a good list. Not just because I respect him as a fighter, but it's because that's actually a pretty damn good list. This one from the Squared Circle. Number one, Usyk. Number two, Canelo. Number three, Crawford. Number four, Inoue. Number five, Estrada. Number six, Gonzalez. Number seven, uh, Josh Taylor, number eight, Errol Spence, number nine, Lomachenko, number ten, Ioka, number one, Usyk. That, I'm not so sure about, Eddie. I don't think he's done enough to be before Canelo and Crawford, in my honest opinion. Um, yeah. And I will say the next list as well is coming from Team Boxing First. He also has Usyk, number one. Um, Canelo number two, Inoue number three, Crawford number four, Josh Taylor number five, number six, Errol Spence, number seven, uh, Juan Francisco Estrada, number eight, Vasily Lomachenko, number nine, Kazotu Ioka, number ten, George Cambosos Jr. So who's missing out of that list there? I'm not sure who's missing. It's a good list, actually. But um, again, well, Usyk number one in two lists in a row. I mean, look, he's he's done a hell of a hell of a job, man. He's his career right now is he's on he's on the road to the hall for sure. So I mean I can't be mad at the list that you know these guys putting him high on the list. Um, he, like I said, he's been doing a great job. I mean, like I said before too, uh, you know with these lists, it's beauty is in the eye to be older. You know what I mean? Whoever you happen to like a little better than maybe somebody who even has more you know uh, qualifications for being there may be ignored. You know what I mean? Because you like this other guy better, so. That's why I think it's on a list by list basis, man. And you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. So, no wrong answers, like you said, Joe. <laughs> we just gotta, we just gotta deal with it. <laughs> um, moving on to Daniel O seven O seven one five nine seven. Uh, he says, number one, Crawford, number two, Usyk, number three, Josh Taylor, number four, Errol Spence, number five, Tank Davis, number six, Baturbiev, number seven, Bivol, number eight, Inoue, that's high on the list, number nine, Donaire, number ten, Fury. Um, what can I critique there? Crawford and Usyk, number one and two, always good. Josh Taylor, number three, maybe a bit high. Errol Spence, number four, get that out. Number five, uh, Tank Davis, number number six. Baturbiev, number seven, Bivol, Inoue, number eight, I think could have been a bit higher, Donair wouldn't be in my top ten, um, and Tyson Fury gets number ten, okay, moving on to this one here, it's from at Schoolboy Let, this guy's name is Eddie, um, I want to say this is, the, yeah, this is the final one, uh, Canelo, number one, Bud, number two, Usyk, number three, Josh Taylor, number four, Cambosos, number five, now, no way should he be top five, Spence, number six. Well, we know how I feel about that. Seven, Jamel Charlo. Eight, Baturbiev. Nine, Inoue. Ten. And the reason I left this one to a last is because he has put a guy in number ten who I'm putting as number ten on my list. Shakur Stevenson, Eddie. Oh, I definitely like his number ten. <laughs> I like his number ten. That kid, he, I think he's been a little bit under under uh, mentioned. Uh, and all the other lists, <laughs> but I mean, like I said, it's an out of beholder. Um, he's done a lot of good things, especially this year, winning, um, you know, winning that, uh, that fight in the way, in the fashion that he won against. Um, oh, gosh, what is wrong with my head? I just had his name in my mind, and on the tip yeah. of my tongue, it was yeah, Jamel Herring, and and the way he won that fight was impressive, and just in general. Him as a fighter, his his ability and just how he carries himself with, uh, with the way he fights is, is, is that he definitely should be definitely involved in this list a little bit, a little more often with more people, <laughs> more people putting him in. But uh, like I said before, there's no wrong answers, <laughs> and it, the, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it depends on who you like. And now my list, just to finally wrap it up, this is the final part of the uh, the the 
the part two really uh, the final part here my list so my top 10 pound for pound list number one Canelo number two Crawford number three Usyk number four Lomachenko number five Inouye number six Golovkin number seven Josh Taylor number eight Demetrius Andrade. I don't think anyone had him in their list number nine I've gone with Jamal Charlo and number 10 Shakur Stevenson um I've got to give an honourable mention to a few guys that didn't make the cut. Oscar Valdez, who I think is still undefeated, moving up the weights, getting wins. I think he certainly deserves, um, you know, he, he deserves a place really in, in a top 10 list. It's not going to be mine, but he's just just outside of it. As is Tyson Fury, as is Artem Baturbiev, as is Bivol, as is Javante Davis, as is um, uh, Gary Russell Jr., as is um, Errol Spence. Mikey Garcia's come crashing out of my list. He was in my list. Um, and, yeah, Gilberto Ramirez as well. Another one that's, you know, in my top 20, but not in my top 10. But like I said, that's my list. Again, it doesn't mean I'm right. You can critique me if you want. You can absolutely laugh your heads off at what I've, what I've gone with there. Um, but, yeah, that's my list as well. So um, I'm going to compare my list to a few other guys. And then perhaps... On the outro, I might give away a t-shirt or two to some people that sent in good lists and also good category answers for more than one category. We will get onto that on the outro. But like I say, that's it for all the talking. In part one, we did the categories. We did the review part. It was very brief. Um, then we brought you our special guest, the former unified middleweight world champion, Daniel Gill. In part two, we've done the brief news part, the fight between Belfort and Chad Dawson. We've done the preview part, which was very, very quick, one card. And then we've just done your pound for pound list. So I just want to say once again, thank you all for your contributions this week. It's been a tremendous show. We've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I've been looking forward to it for months on end, really, to talk about all these fantastic things that's happened in this year, especially after 2020, which was rough for us all. But it's now time for me to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 324 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. This has been the end of the year 2021 special. Um, a huge shout out to our special guest, the former unified middleweight world champion, Daniel Gill. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. I do want to make you all aware of something real bizarre, though, that um, I meant to say earlier on in the show, to be honest with you, but it's got to be said before we wrap things up. It was something that went down this month actually a former two-time boxing world champion who had over 100 pro fights i think his record was <laughs> 97 and 5 in his pro career um this month alone he refereed 18 fights sorry refereed 10 fights judged 18 fights and despite being only five foot six in height he had a bare knuckle boxing match against a guy who was six foot five and he won only in boxing you could not make it up I bet you can't um, tell me who that guy's name is. We shall see. But um, the winner of the t-shirt giveaway competition for the, for his contributions to the 2021 end of year categories goes to Johnny Jangles 11. So he gets a t-shirt and so does Dan Roach um, for his input with, with his pound for pound boxing list. So two t-shirts to be given away there. Both of you, please send myself or Eddie a direct message on Twitter or a tweet to claim your prizes. But that's about everything from my Myself. I want to wish you all a fabulously happy new year and we shall see you all again in 2022.